And you were just like, dude, who cares? It's stupid politics. In other words, children often do not understand the implications of politics. So what? The president got shot. Dude, we get to go out from school. High five. They don't realize it. But then they're trying to read the importance of the political event through the way the adults around them act. And Elena realizes that people are really, really upset. In other words, something's, something's going on, right? And she says it at the bottom of 247. Though I wanted to feel the right thing about President Kennedy's death, I could not fight the feeling of elation, happiness, that stirred in my chest. Today was the day I was going to visit Eugene in his house. He had asked me to come over after school to study for an American history test. And of course, a close reader will go, uh... So we got interesting conflagration of coming together of several major themes all happening at this moment. She's going to Eugene's house to study American history. She is, of course, living on this day, the, many argue, most infamous day in American history. And of course, finally, Elena is going to learn something about America and something about American history. Not from a textbook, but from a rejection. We will call that rejection an epiphany. Do you understand? Epiphany, an insight. Notice the genius of the story is not that we're ever told what that epiphany is, but we as readers get to experience it with her. Let's go now to the end of the story, right? She says, it, um, um, she says that as she got ready to go, over to Eugene's house, she felt ashamed about the fact that she came from L building, which blocked the sun, right? Of course, she says that, first of all, she did not expect the reaction from her mother. Let's point out the genius of the story. It isn't the reaction from Eugene's mother, it's the reaction from her own mother. You're going out, you shouldn't go out. The president's been killed. We must show respect. She asks, come to church with me tonight. Notice, she says it. Elena, I, I don't have time. I've got to go study. I've got to go study. You can get this, you know, picture in your mind's eye. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. That's the way children would be, right? Of course, mama will say it. You are forgetting who you are. Now, this will be the key line of the story. You'll, you'll notice I often point out the key line in these texts. Look at it on page 249. She says it out loud. You are forgetting who you are, Nina. I have seen you staring down at that boy's house. Look at the final line on 249. Read it with me. It's a compelling line. This is a mother. Remember, now we're going to have a mother here in a moment playing a central role in the story. But it isn't this mother. This is her mother. Look what her mother says. She says, you're forgetting who you are. Read it with me. Bottom of 249. You are heading for humiliation and, the top of 250, pain. But notice the observation. It's as if she's saying this, but she's almost saying this like, you're about to learn a lesson here, and I'm going to let you learn this lesson. And what you're going to learn is humiliation and pain. Of course, we the reader are already starting to see this is what we call foreshadowing in a story. If you're an astute reader of the story, you've got to figure out a little bit sooner than Elena what's about to happen. What does Mama know is about to happen? She understands that this girl, that her daughter, is going to show up at this house and there's going to be a response that she did not, the young girl, did not expect. Hmm. The genius of the story, of course, is that next we are told about the neighborhood. Notice the brilliance of this story on page 250. Again, I'm trying to teach you how to be a close reader. I walked out to the street around the chain link fence that separated L building from Eugene's house. The yard was neatly edged around the little walk that led to the door. It almost amazed me how Patterson, the inner core of the city, had no apparent logic to its architecture, the way it was constructed. Small, neat, single residences like this one could be found right next to a huge, dilapidated apartment buildings like L building. My guess was that the little houses had been there first, then the immigrants had come in droves, and the monstrosities had been raised for them, and then the list. This is called America, guys. Read it with me. The Italians, the Irish, the Jews, and now us, the Puerto Ricans, and the blacks. The idea here is that this is America. This neighborhood is America. 
Of course, there are going to be a lot of people who are deeply unsettled about this as being America. And yet, this is American history. Back to the title again, the brilliance of the story. She knocks softly, I'm on 250. The mother's question is a fascinating one. What do you want? You can emphasize, of course, the you, right? What do you want? We're going to come to this thing about you people here in a little bit. What do you want? Notice, I'm Eugene's friend. He asked me to come over to study. I thrust out my books, a silly gesture that embarrassed me almost immediately. She recognizes there's something wrong right away. She's embarrassed. The mother, of course, says, you live there, pointing to Elbow. Which looked particularly ugly. Look at the look at the adjectives. I'm, I'm at the top of 251. Read it with me. Which looked particularly ugly, like a gray prison, with its many dirty windows and rusty fire escapes. Of course, fire escape is where all the story had begun, right? The notion, of course, of prison comes to mind here, right? That is to say, trapped, economically trapped, racially trapped, and it's already the epiphany is starting to begin. Oh. You are where you grow up. Let's write that one down. Because this is an interesting epiphany. You are where you grow up. This mother is going to make assumptions about this girl simply in the realization of where she... Oh, you're, you live in that building. Which makes you somehow the other. Which makes you different. Which makes you you people. As we'll get to it. Right? The woman had stepped halfway out. Of course, the answer is, yeah, I do. I mean, how can you ignore it? She looked intently at me for a couple of heartbeats, then said as if to herself, I don't know how you people do it. I'm sorry, you people? What do you mean, you people? Like, you're talking about you people as in kids that go to the school? Is that what you mean by you people? I mean, what do you mean by you people? Of course, this is a euphemism, isn't it, right? You people is that dividing line. It's that line between us and them. It's that line, of course, here between the white and the non-white. I don't know how you people, right, do it. To continue, then directly to me, listen, honey, Eugene doesn't want to study with you. He's a smart boy, doesn't need help. You understand me? I'm truly sorry. Whoa. In other words, I will speak for my son. He has no interest in you. And of course, let's point out that the pronoun you here begins to carry double meaning, doesn't it? He has no interest in you, as in Elena. He has no interest in you, as in you people. In other words, whoa, here is the coming of the epiphany. Elena will not be allowed to study or to in any way speak with her son because who she is. What do you mean who she is? She's an American. Now, now, now we're to the title, American History. To continue, notice he says, he can't study with you, it's nothing personal. It's a fascinating line. It's nothing personal. How many times in 3B, how many times has racism often treated this way? Oh no, it's nothing personal. I'm not a racist. It's nothing personal. It's just, I behave racist. Hmm. It's nothing personal, she says. Keep reading. You understand we won't be in this place much longer. This place. Next to our building, obviously. No need for him to get close to people. And we're back to the word people again, right? You people. I'll just make it, it'll just make it harder for him later. Run back home now. Significant, of course, is that she can't move. Why can't she move? Well, this is the power of the epiphany. It's hitting Elena what her mother said. Remember? Humiliation and pain. Oh, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do I do in a moment? like this. We're told at the end of the story that night her parents would not discuss their dreams for the future or life in Puerto Rico as they often did. That night was a night of mourning. Notice for her that night she says it was mourning but strictly for me. And then at the end of the text we have back to the setting again looking up at the light. Look at all the genius of this final line on 252. I could see the white snow falling like a lace white veil over its face. I did not look down to see it turning gray as it touched the ground below. 
The genius, of course, of this story, and now let's jump to level two and three quickly to finish. The genius of the story is, again, that we have something said without it actually being said. In other words, the roots of racism lie deep in the nation's history. The roots of racism lie deep in family history. The roots of racism lie deep in economic history. Where you live defines in large measure how you're accepted or not accepted in 1963. Of course, the story being read today challenges us to look back and ask, has American history changed? Have we evolved as a country? Do we still think of people as different because of their different backgrounds, their skin color? their religious affiliations, their sexual proclivities, whatever it is, the, the, the ways in which we draw lines to somehow define us versus them. Let's go ahead and inject now, at level two, a term which we can use in 303 and we will use often, and that is the two terms of inclusivity, exclusivity. Let's write these down. Inclusivity is that I include people because they're human. I include people. We think, of course, of the great Mahat Gandhi as our classic example in history here. Exclusivity is, of course, drawing those lines. We think immediately of Hitler, don't we? There's us and there's them, and there's something wrong with them, and fundamentally, they will never be us. Of course, at 2A, then we've got all kinds of possible messages, themes here. One of them is that there's different tragedies that can happen within a tragedy, right? Think about how you can relate it 3A. This text to the reading of Lady Bird Johnson's diary and the ways in which those two texts tell about the same event that day, but there was a different understanding of American history for Elena in this story, no question, right? Obviously, as well, at 2A, we can say that this is a story where you have a clear difference between youth and adults. The children jump rope together, and she even envies someone with different skin color. But, of course, the adults in the story have a completely different interpretation and understanding of what it means in terms of this issue of living together. Finally, number three, the notion of setting in this story plays into this major theme that you are where you live. You are where you live until you can begin to see beyond where you live and the ways that you've been raised. You don't have to hold the views of the people who raised you. You make a choice. And of course, in this story, her choices are, I'm going to Eugene's house in spite of what her mother said, uh, warns her. And now she, she gets to kind of deal and live with that epiphany, we might say. Notice the disturbing element of the story. We never see Eugene again in the story, and we often wonder. I've, I've sometimes had freshmen write the second story, where, for example, there's a knock on her window, and there's Eugene, who has climbed up the fire escape, and they begin to have a conversation. You could continue this story. How does this story play out, if you will? It's always going to ask us to speculate. Let's jump to 2B really quickly. Not what Kofor says, but how she says it. This is a geniusly constructed story. There's no question. You're looking at classic genius prose here when you look at a story like this, where again, something is said without it being said. Go back to the title. The title, American History Now for You, now that you've read this story closely, this story has all kinds of implications. American? What does it mean to be an American? History? What does that even mean? history. And of course, who gets to tell the history? And who gets to tell about what is right and what is wrong in history? The storybooks are always written by victors, the winners. As Voltaire, the great philosopher of French Enlightenment said, of course, there's always the challenge, well, what's the true history? What's the real history? Here we have Elena learning about American history on the day when American history was, of course, made. Right? Let's jump to 3A. Well, it's true, of course, this text forces you to relate one text to another text or another moment in history and time. Every time from here on out that you ever hear about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, you're going to remember the story of American history and what Elena learned on that classic, on that important day. What is for you great stories about racism? What is for you your favorite song that addresses the very issue of the importance of inclusivity versus exclusivity? I've already mentioned Gandhi as being a completely opposite example from Adolf Hitler. Think about how those two important thinkers living at the same time in history had two different, completely different views 
of this notion of inclusivity and exclusivity, right? Of course, in 3B, this, this story does demand, I think, some responses. You can understand why I said to you, some freshmen see this story as a pretty controversial story, because it does demand you to think about your own views about what America is. Isn't it a great place? that so many different cultures can live together and cohabitate. So many different languages can be spoken. Isn't that an amazing thing about our country? Or rather, do you have the view that says there's something wrong with that kind of view? We should all become more similar, not less similar. And how do a group of people who are quite different culturally cohabitate and live together and get along? And finally, this question. Do you think racism is natural? Or rather, as this story suggests, when you're children, you don't see color. You don't understand that you are where you grew up. Notice, Elena lives in the building and has no sense of her that, oh, maybe I should be ashamed or embarrassed about where I live until, of course, she is taught this kind of thing, right? The challenge, of course, then, is to live in a world where there is racism, but to combat it with love, right? to combat it with inclusivity. And how do you learn that? Well, of course, one of the classic ways to learn that is to see racism play out in all of its ugliness. We see it, we witness it here in our story. Through the eyes of Elena, we see it, right? And then we challenge ourselves. How do we ourselves try to maybe live a more inclusivist life? Well, I'll leave the story to you. It's a challenging story, and I hope you think differently maybe about American history as well. Thank you.